Now, moving on. So we will have to keep up the, our tempo and not to stop. And the next topic is invisible wounds of war to see, to care, to treat. And a psychotherapist, the head of the development of psychological rehabilitation of Unbroken Center, Oleg Borizuk, is going to present that topic. Thank you, dear friends. Maybe you just joined us on the third day of the summit. For you, we would like to give a good warm round of applause. It's a tradition and the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Oleg Berezuk. I'm a psychiatrist, psychotherapist. I work at Lviv National Medical University. And of course, I'm the head of mental health service in Unbroken Centrum and Territorial Medical Unit number one in Lviv. Today, I would like to talk about invisible wounds of war. If we talk about amputations, unfortunately in Ukraine, we are going to have tens of thousands of such patients. If we talk about invisible war traumas, we are going to have millions of people with these traumas. So we need to learn because until now, we do not quite know how to see these invisible wounds of war, how to care of people with these injuries and traumas, and we need to know how to treat them. Minister Leoshko, at the very beginning of the war, made a kind of prognosis, and I think it was very accurate, that around 15 million Ukrainians will need psychological support, and three to four million will require quite serious medical treatment. So that was in the very beginning of the war. So the Gratis research tells us that 72% of Ukrainians feel stressed they have stress-related problems due to the full-scale war. And then Minister Leshko also tells what will happen to people undergoing war stress. Those are very different psychosomatic problems, starting from diabetes mellitus and down to infarctions, circulation disorders, hypertension, PTSD, if not seen and treated, will lead to even more psychological and psychiatric disorder. Also can lead to alcohol, drug abuse, suicidal attempts and suicidal behaviors. In the very beginning of the war, I, I had a talk with a colonel of American army, a surgeon who used to tell me, Oleg, you need to take care of men after war, because we have a story and the experience in from the US when after the Vietnam War, we lost much more men after the war than during the war due to stress and PTSD and other stress related disorders. So three invisible wounds of war, somatic disorders due to war stress. So you might tell, we can see them why you're telling they're invisible, but it's really very often that these disorders are not perceived as war related that uh, are uh, related to psychological war trauma. So they are perceived as trivial, uh, trivial problems, but they need to be treated differently. Uh, the next war trauma, unseen, but that is there is post-traumatic stress disorders. We'll be talking more about that. And number three, another one, almost not discussed, not mentioned. Well, uh, concussions, TBI with TBIs, or we call them concussion or commotion trauma, concussion. 
So when we have tens of thousands of amputations, so there'll be hundreds of thousands of concussions. And speaking about PTSD and other mental disorders related to war, will be millions. So what do we pay attention, first of all? Something that we see that is visible, but uh, it's mandatory for us to learn to see what is not seen, what is invisible. Otherwise, we will lose control and we will not be able to help people. So all the healthcare workers need to be at least half a centimeter ahead. It's not easy. And also we had a small study. We don't have time to do that, to do studies, but we really need to do that. And we ask our partners to help us with the studies, with the trials. But we had one small trials. It was a questionnaire and it was a questionnaire for 100 military servicemen. Among them, there were only those who had just PTSD without injury. But we didn't differ differentiate at that time concussions. At that time, for us, it was invisible, but PTSD with concussion and PTSD without concussion is a totally different thing, So and the approach is different. And all the military servicemen who came to our hospital were wounded. So among all the hospital patients who came as wounded, we had 28 0.8% of patients who had PTSD. And actually, it's the same uh, figures that we see from the NATO studies that out of all people who come back from the battlefield, um, around 30% develop PTSD. And of course, post-traumatic stress disorder was seen in psychiatric patients and who were treated in a psychiatric unit and who came with a psychiatric diagnosis. A very briefly, out of the clusters and criteria of PTSD, the symptoms is almost the same. It's 40% of intrusive pathology. Avoiding treatment, 21%, negative depressive feelings, 22%, and hyperagitation, 28%, hyperarousal out of all people with PTSD. It's important to see out of all patients who were in the hospital, the wounded soldiers, 10% had severe depression. That's a lot. And among those who were in the psychiatric unit, 58 of those had severe depression. So actually, this is the acute stage. And our patients come to the hospital usually after five to two weeks after the injury. So it is still the acute stress disorder. I would like to show you briefly the model that we are working with since the very first day. Because the very first day of war, I realized even if we know something we could not do everything. So we didn't know a lot in the beginning and we had to, to learn a lot. But still, we opened the first in Ukraine psychiatric unit in a um, general hospital. It was like a quiet revolution, 28 beds that have changed our hospital. Today, if you ask the surgeon, the therapist, rehabilitation specialist or whoever, so how about the psychiatry unit? Unit, so we cannot imagine, they say, how we could have lived without it. Although in the beginning, they said we, we didn't want that crazy house, but it's a stigma from uh, the post-Soviet Union times. Well, all such services were provided only in isolated hospitals. But now it, this unit is part of a general hospital and it's not expensive. You just have to create nice conditions, convenient, uh, like have a to paint the walls nicely and good staff who realize and know what this mental trauma is. And in May 22, we opened the outpatient center of psychological, psychotherapeutic, psychiatric care to patients. How did that happen? We had a dream, but we didn't have a, the resources for that. And then the IT specialist 
started to work with us and IT people came to us and they said, we want to invest in your uh, hospital. We want to help people. And we asked what kind of specialty you are interested in. And they said mental health. So we supported that desire of the IT people and uh, we created this outpatient center, mental health outpatient center, serving thousands and thousands of patients, military people, their family, and civil population as well. So we treat them. So we also take civil people who have problems. They come to our center and they pay for themselves according to uh, National uh, Health Service of Ukraine. And psychotherapeutic service is a paid service. And so these people are not IDPs or something. So they're just civil people. They pay according to the menu, so to say. So we treat military people as well who have receive their injuries at war and it's free of charge for them and for their families and the hospital helps us to pay for them the hospital gives money for that a little portion is taken from the national health care service of ukraine uh, but we have to revise the psychiatric uh, benefit package and the huge part the biggest part we receive from donors like Canadian Red Cross in particular, because together with us, they've created a unique problem uh, program, I'm sorry, to give salaries to uh, people who have suffered due to war and who work in our center. We are very thankful to them for that. And this mechanism could work in other hospitals as well. This is a very important thing. We have several groups that we have to approach differently. PTSD in military and civilians, not wounded. It's one of the groups. PTSD in children is a totally different group. Not many people know how to serve, take care of that group. We learn how to do that. PTSD in people with wounds, bodily wounds. I need to tell you an important thing. People who have lost their limbs and we see them and we help them, they have very good compensatory mechanisms. They have a desire to rehabilitate, to overcome their deficits. At the very beginning, they have low level of anxiety, depression and PTSD because they're very motivated. People who have thoracic abdominal injury or TBI have a high level of PTSD and high anxiety and depression level, and we need to pay attention to them in the very beginning, although we don't see them, it's not visible. PTSD with neurotrauma, these are concussions. If we start to treat PTSD in a person without taking history, without finding out that he have had concussions, and usually people don't uh, voice that because concussions is uh, routine in this brutality war, in this brutal war. And the level of brutality of this war is very often compared to World War One, And patients just don't remember about their concussions. But we need to ask them if we start to treat PTSD and you don't know it was a concussion, zero result, because cognition is something that we need to pay, pay atten attention to. And it doesn't work in such patients. So we've created a new service, neuropsychology. We've trained six persons together with the New Orleans University. They were trained by the specialists from this university. And six specialists, they treat PTSD with neurotrauma. Another difficult group, people who were in captivity and who survived tortures, different approach, caring, trust needs to be used here. So without trust, working in a patient after captivity uh, is useless. Uh, but we've learned that from our French colleagues from Primavera Centre in Paris, who have been caring for such patients for 28 years already. So relationship is number one. Uh, we just care of them, care about them. Somatic disorders, 
patients with grief of loss. We didn't see PTSD in civilians in the very beginning, but the civil people, civilians had that sometimes even more than in military people. When we come to a room, and actually we visit every person who has come with an evacuation train, and we visit every person. We didn't see any civilians in the beginning. We didn't see PTSD in civilians, but the study helped us because if it's a military person, so usually we have intrusion, aggression symptoms, agitation, and it is visible. You can see that, but in civilians, in patients who have lost their health, family sometimes, or house, housing, work, land, such patients, they have symptoms of grief and loss manif manifested by depression. So that person's just lying in the corner of the room and not wanting to anyone, anyone taking care of him and paying attention to him. Also, PTSD in family members is another group. We also noticed recently women who are caring, taking care of the wounded husbands, they're very much motivated to help husbands, but they don't see their own PTSD. So we started to provide uh, group therapies for PTSD in women, in wives, and of course, PTSD in service, health service providers. So two thirds of our workers, as we noticed, had acute uh, infectious respiratory diseases uh, this uh, spring. It never happened before that so many people got sick at the same time. And by the way, the hygiene is okay in our hospital. So we're not spending too much resources uh, to help those who help others. And that's our mistake. We need to help ourselves. Our model is very simple. So it's a pharmacotherapy, up to 30% of support. Even the protocols that we read about SSRIs do not help the way we want it to help. And if we have doctors that are not prescribing that or prescribing that still we don't see the best results. But what is the most important, and the rest 40 to 60 to 70 percent is psychotherapy. What kind of psychotherapy? Cognitive behavioral therapy, of course, CBT, and prolonged exposition, exposure therapy. Each psychologist and psychotherapist that works in our hospital needs to know how to use this simple instrument in PTSD. Five to seven sessions, correct interventions. It takes about Get, gets rid away of 90% of symptoms, PTSD. Also, it's EMDR therapy. You know about that therapy. It's a wonderful therapy for people who avoid being treated, but it unites, so to say, the head and the body. Each psychology of our center needs to know stabilization techniques, including EMDR technique. Everyone needs to know that. Body-oriented therapy, Ms. Irina has mentioned that today. So what's the evidence-based? So we learned it from our French colleagues, Prima Levia. Thanks to that therapy, after we have established trust and care, we come to our patients who came after being tortured and who were in captivity because it's a tra tragedy for them. Because the injury and wound of torture is invisible and unspeakable horror. And art therapy. Art therapy is a therapeutic CT or MRI, that's what we call it. And when I'm in a dead corner with a working with a patient, I come to the art therapist and I ask, please show me his or her pictures. 
and I find the way it's a very it's not something like it's not just a play or a game art therapy is powerful tool our therapist who is the art therapist has been uh, studying for six years um, uh, plus four additional so it's not an easy thing to learn and instrumental therapy we love it VR, transcranial magnetic stimulation, slow shift vibration therapy, of course, they're very helpful, very instrumental. Some of them have the evidence base, like, for example, transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's allowed, the protocol is there for uh, resilient or resistant depression. We use that to treat such patients with success. Uh, but we've seen, as well as our American colleagues, that it, it is helpful for patients with PTSD with organic disorder. And sometimes the patients uh, who have speech problems uh, during the 30, after the 30 or 40 sessions, they start to speak normally. So VR, today we have our partner here. Please remind me, a speech, a speech company. By our order, they have developed a method that helps to uh, the, optimize the time of MDR. We call it bubbles. And patients love it because patients love everything that it's nice and cute, but helpful at the same time. And hopefully we will have our further cooperation and um, hopefully that we will have our research uh, to get done together. The main factors is the teamwork. One person person is helpless. So clinical rounds every week to see patients who come to the hospital who are admitted. And everyone goes there because every one of the team needs to see 2.5 hours. Also on our way, we look at our patients who has been there for some time. Clinical consultation of complex cases every Tuesday, like intern or resident or psychotherapist are preparing a case to discuss and when we all discuss it together. Clinical supervision, intervision in group setting every week, Tuesday and once a month for leading therapist group. It's useful not to, for diagnosis and treatment, it's also for the therapist himself, because help we help others. Also, we need to help ourselves. And surely training. We uh, were trained by the uh, French uh, colleagues, and uh, actually uh, in, in France, uh, they, they have to uh, have uh, publications in the uh, scientific journals. Uh, that's a part of the uh, contract, and it's a part of the effort to uh, make sure their work is known to others. And also this uh, prevents uh, secondary PTSD. Well, that's uh, what has been proven by the uh, modern uh, uh, science, and we keep learning from that uh, as well. So uh, these are the partners we are learning from. Um, our uh, colleagues, uh, the uh, Yale University, uh, Tulane University, uh, Charité, there was uh, one uh, other uh, French partner, Primo Levi, which uh, for some reason is not here in the slide, and our Israeli colleagues. When the Israelis were visiting us, unfortunately, they cannot do this uh, today because uh, they have lots of work uh, at home. But when they were visiting, they were bringing the best, uh, the most applicable tools for work and worse PTSD. They uh, were not just cognizant of the theory, they have lots of practical experience. So, uh, basic pH, uh, search for resources for the patient, and the physical therapy, and uh, lots of things they have uh, developed to support patients with PTSD. Uh, these are our uh, 
other partners, Live IT uh, Cluster and the Canadian Red Cross. We keep searching for more resources. The government is indeed doing its best, but we are encouraging governments to spend more money uh, on the military equipment. And we need to do our part of the work. We need to build these partnerships for the decades ahead. We are taking care for the prosthetics and we want to make sure that uh, these people actually live uh, great lives uh, in the uh, broader context. And, uh, well, uh, that's the uh, reality we have to deal with. We want to share this experience that we have amassed over this year and a half. We want uh, every uh, regional or city hospital in Ukraine to have a small psychiatric unit or a mental health center, and they will live happily ever after. Uh, we will not uh, hope with everything on our own, because we have two challenges. One challenge is the number of patients, and the minister has warned us that there can be over a million patients, and also the brutality of trauma that uh, triggers uh, terrible reactions of our psyche and organic reactions as well. So accessibility should be much higher. Just one well-established center is not enough. There should be a couple of such centers in every region of Ukraine. And we are currently in touch with other places. In the districts of uh, Lviv region, we have uh, already launched uh, five or six such uh, small mental health centers. When people are discharged from the hospital, they have received medical care, they can keep on using uh, those mental health centers to support their mental health. This was a brief presentation of our experience. And this was Alea Perisuk. Thank you so much. So uh, we uh, will surely use this opportunity for a brief Q&A. Uh, let this be brief questions and brief answers. If you have any questions, I'm looking at Irina Zaslavets. Yes, surely you have lots of questions to discuss between you. You uh, will have some time. And uh, yeah. Do we have any questions? Thank you. So, round of applause for this 